Uh, we're going to talk about radio resource management. This is a, I take this to be a generic term in the industry. Yes, other, um, other vendors or some vendors may use this term. Some vendors may use other terminology for it. You, you may hear terms like um, you know, Aruba has ARM, Cisco has RM, uh, Aerohive has ACSP, uh, Ruckus has one called Channel Fly. You'll hear different names, uh, terminology for this, but I'm taking RM to be in the generic, if you will. Uh, first, a quick shout out to, uh, to NetScout. Um, this, I've already done a webinar on this material, so this is the second presentation of this material. I thought it was a pretty important topic, so uh, I left it on their, um, their, their slide uh, presentation deck. So uh, thanks to them for letting me do a webinar with them, so I left, left everything uh, as is. With, I say that except for a couple of pieces of content. I did make a couple of little pe uh, pieces of changes in this, uh, hopefully for the better, uh, due to some... Uh, live tweeting that happened during the webinar. Let's, <laughs> I did a lot of homework, so uh, uh, for any hecklers in the audience, which is probably gonna be half of you, um, uh, ju just note that I, I did a little bit additional homework uh, due to the webinar, so uh, we'll, we'll move along. Uh, no, nothing's confidential here. Uh, we're, uh, this, yeah, anyway. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of controversy about RRM out there, and I'm probably the instigator of most of it. But I, <laughs> but there's a never-ending debate, and there's definitely two sides to every story. You know, I'm I will say right up front, my personal preference is to any time that I can reasonably do a static plan, I will. There are times when I have not been able to do that, and so I've had to to use RRM either because a customer asked me to, told me to, or I had no real choice in the matter in some some fashion. But nevertheless. If I have a choice in a reasonable situation, I will choose static. So that's my, my preference. I don't want you to think I don't have one. I certainly do. But I'm trying to be at least reasonably fair here. Um, and, you know, I went back and looked at my presentation to make sure that I'm not, you know, being completely lopsided here. I mean, certainly my opinion, I think, might come through. But, you know, to be fair, there are situations where RM is a reasonable solution. Uh, I just want to make sure to put it in proper context. So the, the argument... You'll see, uh, we say static, you know, static planning has a, a lower OPEX. I, I believe that that's a reasonable uh, assertion. I, I certainly hear that at times. Um, and an RRM can be tuned to be as good as static. I've heard that. And I believe that in some cases that can be true, not in all cases. So I think it's a reasonable assertion. Um, you don't want APs to react to RF events. Um, you know, some people say you do want, some people say you don't want it. Um, so again, you know, we don't have time to manually plan and deploy this. That's ridiculous. Just turn it on automatic and let it all figure it out, figure it all out. And you know, how do I know, you know, how the RM is going to react? How do I know that it's doing the right thing? So all these are, are reasonable uh, things to consider. Um, <clears throat> so my prime directive here is trying to be fair. I do have an opinion. I'm not neutral on this topic. I'm not. But at the same time, I want to be fair to those who think, uh, you know, from a different perspective. So a lot of different things that we're going to um, cover here, and as you can see, topics, and I'm going to move very quickly because one hour will go by in a very big hurry. So uh, first, what is it? Radio resource management is a uh, kind of a generic term in, in my, the way I take it to, to mean uh, ch automatic channel and power uh, changing. In other words, the system is determining your automatic or automatically your power and channel decisions. Okay, uh, it, it may react uh, to interferers, it may react to co-channel interference, um, it, it may react to a lot of things. And of course, turning it may or may not turn off radios, turn up radios, down radios, depending on the capability. Now, radio resource management, or RRM for short, is uh, it's very different across different vendors. Some vendors are better at it than others. There's no doubt about that. But you know, everybody's got their strong suits. You know, you might say one vendor's better at RRM, but then that uh, uh, you know that vendor's weaker in some other area. So this is not to say that some vendors got it all figured out. I think that again, some some folks use. Uh, use RRM as a competitive differentiator, and, and that, of course, is their prerogative. So, so why is it that this is such a controversial topic? You know, why, um, why not engineers and marketers get, you know, all bent out of shape when we start talking about this? Well, uh, it's been my personal experience that, that they use RRM as a differentiator, and when you call their baby ugly, or you call their baby anything but pretty, um, they, uh, they, they, lose their, uh, they lose their lunch over it. So they, they're going to uh, market that it solves every problem. If you tune it, if, it's, if you have this chipset, if you blah, 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 it's perfect. And it, it's, uh, you know, if you say anything bad about it, they're going to shoot you in the foot. 
But it's my, my belief, and it's been my experience, that uh, this, this messaging, this marketing messaging, it promotes lazy engineering. You don't need no stinking survey. You don't need to design RM. We'll just figure it out for you. And, I, and I, most good engineers won't tell you that. Uh, most of them will say, RRM won't fix a bad design. You should design well, and then RRM can tune from there. And you should tune RRM uh, to be its best, which I believe is true also, okay? So speaking out against various vendors on this, or I'm not trying to smack a vendor across the mouth, I'm trying to smack all the vendors across the mouth. Uh, and, and so, so I, I'm, I'm, I, I wanna be clear about that. It's not picking on a vendor. It's, it's making sure that, that you know the truth of the matter, and that is it's not perfect. Can it be tuned to be okay? Sure, in some cases, better than others. Some vendors better than others, but it's not a solve everything kind of situation, okay? So with manual chan channel planning uh, and power planning, you need the proper tools, of course. Um, you know, this, uh, this is a Net NetScout content that I created, so I'm not, gonna, uh, I'm not trying to smack any uh, competitors. Don't get me wrong there. I use their, their products, because that's fair. So uh, things like Air Magnet Planner and Survey, uh, and of course, the pro proper process is required. You know, optimization of your infrastructure configuration and AP placement is an iterative process. If you look at this, this uh, um, flowchart that I have here, you'll see three distinct situations. First is the, the top, the circle, and the square there. Th those are where you gather information and you do your design. And then after you design, you're going to install and configure. And after you install and configure, you're going to validate and optimize. Those are the three major steps of any kind of deployment. So in the, in, if you're trying to do a, um, well, let me, let me just put it this way. A lot of folks come to me and say, hey, Dev, uh, we, just, we just sold the customer uh, 600 APs, and they hung, them, uh, hung these new 11AC APs where the 11AG uh, APs were. Can you come out here and survey and tell us how to fix it? I mean, how ridiculous. You know, the sales guy made his money or her money, and then, um, then they hang, hang the risk on the little guy that's supposedly the expert because they somehow have RF goggles, and they can go out to the site, walk around, click, click, click. Oh, if you just move this here and move that there and turn this power down, turn that radio off, poof, it's magically perfect, uh, which is going to take a very long time to do. It's an iterative process. It, it's make a change, retest. Make a change, retest. Okay? If you're, uh, if you're doing this, uh, you're doing this type of manual design and plan, you can build a really amazing network. And as soon as you turn on RRM, all bets are off because the algorithm and you are different. You have different goals, you have different input, you have different experience. And so um, RRM can negate all the work you did. It can also enhance what you did. It depends on how good your design is and how good RRM is and how well you tune it, of course. So these modeling tools, uh, and there's several vendors out there that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, the modeling tools ha have no way to link to RRM. There, there's no linkage there. You can't say, well, I've designed it, let's say, in, in uh, Air Magnet Planner. Now, let's export that into ABC Infrastructure Company, and, and it'll take care of it from there. This is not happening, OK? So there's arg arguments for and against Wi-Fi systems being reactive or uh, reacting to RF events. Some people will say, I don't want my system reacting to anything. I want it to be more stable. If there's a microwave oven that's causing a problem, I want to find it and get rid of it. Um, and that can go for many things. You may say, well, if that microwave oven doesn't belong to you, it belongs to your neighbor, you can't exactly go to your neighbor and say, dude, got to get rid of the microwave oven. Okay? Can't do that. So it really comes down to uh, you know, what type of device is it, who owns it, what kind of duty cycle it has, um, you know, whether you can have control of it, and things like this. A lot of decisions can, uh, have to be made here. Okay? If it's co-channel interference is the problem, then you might say, is it my network or is it my neighbor's network? I mean, it's, uh, I do a lot, of, a lot of optimization and surveys, and it's uh, pretty common that your neighbor destroys the environment. So I believe that if you have a system that can ad identify interferers, that the, the number one goal should be to find, identify, find, and remove the interferer. If you can't, then you can take the next step. Um, <clears throat> but that should be the, the primary. So another thing about reacting is RM is a reactive tool. Um, it, it is, it's not going to anticipate 
It doesn't have human intuition, if you will. Okay? It can't learn. There, there are, I've uh, been doing even more studying after the, I delivered this presentation, and learning would be a stretch. Um, there are cases where it can identify pers- uh, some vendors, and a very limited scope of vendors can, can identify persistent uh, interference source and avoid that. So that is, uh, that is the very leading edge of learning, but I wouldn't call it learning. Uh, very importantly, RM uh, is happening in the infrastructure, and they don't, and the infrastructure doesn't see from the client's perspective. Very, very important. And the reactionary measures are very limited. Ch- uh, channel and power, not, not a lot there. So if if you've got event patterns, let's say it's a microwave oven or or some such, and it comes on at a certain time each day and wrecks your environment. If you're going to use RM, I'm hoping that it can, it can learn at least to the level of this thing shows up the same time every day in exactly the same place and wrecks the same channel or channels. Okay? Okay, so if you're constantly changing, doing to being reactive, if your system is always changing channels, you're going to oftentimes end up in a suboptimal scenario. Okay, uh, I call one of these uh, problems the 666 problem. You get... Uh, you get th- two or three or four chan- or APs on the same channel adjacent to each other, and you look at that and go, what happened there? Well, I can tell you what happened. There was no perfect scenario. You know, the radio resource management algorithm said, but I, need, I got this problem over here, and I got this problem over here, and I'm changing this here, 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 and then the, the best case scenario at that point in time was to have all of these particular APs on the same channel, and I've seen it over and over again. Is that to say that it happens every time? No. Is it happen, does it happen more to one vendor than another? Probably, depending on the sophistication of their algorithms. But does it happen to every vendor? It does. Uh, I, I've worked with every vendor on the market. I have surveyed for every vendor on the market. And I'm telling you, um, of course, you do have that problem with single channel architecture all the time. But uh, that's a whole other whole nother ball of wax. Just, just saying. Okay. So you could actually end up in a, a wor- much worse situation than you were to start with. The system reacts and it cha- sets off chain reaction and it just keeps reacting. Okay. And the best situation you have is it, it to, uh, you know, the, you pull the slot machine arm and you happen to hit, you know, get lucky and hit three sevens, right? <clears throat> okay. So, so again, there, uh, a lot of this, the RM is not going to be linked to more sophisticated pieces of the software. You know, your load balancing, your band steering, uh, you know, your fast cure roaming. None of these things are linked uh, that I've seen. Uh, there may be a rare exceptions, and if that's true, um, I, I will say that good for that vendor, but I, I don't see that very much. What if a uh, reaction happens and there's no channel switch announcement? And no, no channel switch announcement means the clients are abandoned on the channel. That's pretty bad. Um, you, you can see that you know, RRM just saying, oh, there's an interferer over there. I think I'll change. That's not enough. That can actually wreck the user, user experience. And let me tell you, user experience is king. You know, it, it, throughput's not king. Uh, features are not king. User experience is king every time. Okay? Uh, I know you probably don't care, and uh, most people don't at least, but you know, RRM can wreck your neighbor's environment too. Okay? Uh, radio resource management is proprietary. It means uh, very seldom are you going to uh, have all the information uh, to know how RM is going to react, what it's going to do in any given situation. Some vendors, to their credit, release more information about their RM than others. Okay? They document well. But that's not to say that they're going to release too much information because this is secret sauce. How it works should be, to some degree, held close to the chest. If they're going to invest a lot of time and money and resources into it, you know, this is uh, so that they can make money off of it, right? This is uh, capitalist America, um, capitalist everywhere, it seems like. Okay? So, it, you know, some vendors will consider this a checkbox feature. Yeah, 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 we have that. It doesn't work at all. It's just horrible. Might as well turn it off. Some vendors have it, and it might work okay at times in situations. A small network works okay. Larger network, not so much. I mean, um, I recently used it at home just to see. And, um, and since there's no 5 gig radios in my entire uh, neighborhood, I said, well, I've got three APs in my house. So I'm going to use 80 megahertz channels. Uh, and so I used three 80 megahertz channels, and I got uh, 36, 104, and 104. I was like, how did that happen, right? <laughs> That's pretty bad. So, um, and, and of course, you know, I, I had done that several times. I'd turn it off, I'd static, I'd go back to automatic. It would pick two of the same. I don't know what was happening there, okay? Happens all the time. 
different vendors have different goals in mind. You know, they're trying to accomplish different things. You know, maybe one vendor wants really good roaming. The, the next one wants to really tune the RF environment, may have spectrum analysis as part of that, of course. So different vendors are trying to do different things. You might have one vendor that deploys a lot of stuff in a super high density or maybe in downtown New York or uh, Times Square or maybe in San Francisco and, and the environment is absolute garbage. And so theirs is tuned for that kind of environment, right? So different vendors, you know, different strokes for different folks. Okay, and, and you may see then some systems, there's different points of decision making. Do the, do the APs make the decision? Like for example, example in controllerless, there's no controller, so there won't be a decision making uh, process for the controller. But with a controller based environment, you know, the controller may be making most of the decisions. It depends on the system type, very important. We mentioned different names for, you know, different trade names or marketing names behind this for different vendors. Okay, now uh, I've used RRM myself again because my customers have told me to, asked me to, what have you, and I've seen it work. I can't say I've never seen it work, I have. Um, but I can tell you this, uh, I can look at it twice and it won't look the same, okay? And you come back the next day and you survey, and you come back the next day and you survey, and it's not gonna look quite the same. Well, which day is better, okay? I guess it's, you know, what time, what's going on, uh, how the system felt about things. I want stability in my network, but if the RM gives you stability, great. Okay. And and this I think is a, a big one. How many how many of you guys are beta testers for the vendors? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> because we all there's only two kinds of people. <laughs> those that are and those who lie and say they're not. <laughs> so vendors go ahead. And, and, pow and power, uh huh, and power. So, uh, for, for example, um, if you if you had so many 2.4 radios on and it kept turning down and down and down to a point where um, it it still had co-channel interference, it should be turning some off. Okay, so power really plays into it in as big a way as channel as channels themselves do. Amen, brother. I can attest to that. Just put me and Sam in the same room. Yeah. But, yeah, I agree. So totally agree on how it should work, how, what's a good thing, what's a bad thing. Yeah, getting, getting, getting two people to agree can be difficult. Totally agree with this. So I'm not standing here saying I have all the answers. I'm not. But what I am doing is trying to call attention to this, that it needs attention. If you're going to use RRM, know what you're using. How does it act, react, and what are you trying to get out of it? And, and it, it's not just, hey, vendor, does that work? It should be, I want to know how to test it. I want to know what I'm looking for. Hey, vendor, or can you show me that it's working? I'm, I'm for that. If you want to use RRM, have somebody show you that it works. Uh, load balancing, yes. Band steering, no. Um, band steering, I wish it would die a horrible death. Um, and, the, and the reason is because I don't want my SSIDs on, on uh, five, 5 gig and 2.4 because that uh, makes uh, additional variance into the user experience. So I, I will avoid band steering in the enterprise. I'll avoid it like the plague. In a, in a VHD environment, I'll use it because that's a completely different environment than the enterprise. And, you know, a stadium, I'm catering to the top 98%. Um, I want those guys to have a good user experience. And the, top, and the bottom 2%, Sorry, go buy a new device. Um, but in the enterprise, you got to make everybody work. You know, everybody's stuff's got to work. Okay? So, <clears throat> all right. So, you know, if, uh, if you like being a QA tester or beta tester for the vendors, great. But vendors only have limited resources, right? You, you know, some of them are quite sizable, but they, they can only put so much... QA resources on this, and it's not exactly the easiest thing in the world. If I were to say, hey, I've got a 100 AP environment, Mr. Vendor, have you tested this in a 100 AP environment? You know how big a 100 AP environment is physically, and that the, the vendor would have to rent a facility perhaps, or at least eat their own dog food, and be able to constantly monitor that to see how well it's doing. Some features are a booger to test, okay? This is one of them, okay? A lot of variables there. 
Uh, some vendors really like their RRM a lot. Uh, they, this is a, a big competitive differentiator for them. And if you try to use their system in a way that you're configuring um, statically, their, their GUI won't, it won't help you much, right? They're trying to push you toward their marketing story. Now, they, it, their, their RRM may work and it may not, but the whole point is you don't have a hell of a lot of choice in some cases. Um, if you use a certain vendor, you're going to be pushed a bit toward RRM. Um, I've seen it. I've had my customers uh, buy equipment and go, I'd really like to static, but man, this is quite the pain trying to static. It's so much easier to just use the RRM feature. One thing I found is that walls, um, really thick, ridiculous walls. This is my favorite wall ever. Uh, I built this wall right here in, on PowerPoint for you. Um, and so this is a great wall. And if you could put chicken wire and maybe some lead paint on there, it'd be great too. <laughs> but really great walls like this makes RRM's job easier, right? If APs can't hear each other, channel reuse plan gets much simpler, <laughs> right? Would you agree? I think so. Um, it's going to make, uh, make for a lot better CCI type environment, you know, a lot less CCI. Additionally, more channels in your channel reuse plan will make RRM work better. Give it more channels. You know, in general, we're working with roughly 24 channels in 5 gig, right? If you, if you take uh, 120, 124, and 128 and put them on the table, take 144 off the table, you got about 24 channels to work with. And so um, more channels is more better. And uh, of course, you start taking channels away, like making 40 megahertz channels and 80 megahertz channels, it makes RM's job much harder. So again, I call this the, the 666 problem when you run in, uh, when RRM will back itself into a corner and you end up seeing uh, multiple channel or the same channel across multiple APs that are adjacent to each other, okay? Sometimes there's just no best option in this scenario. It's just the way the, the, uh, the, the cookie crumbles, if you will. Another problem I see is what I'd call either big power, little power, or big cell, little cell. If you turn on RRM right out of the box and you don't tune it, I mean, even proponents of RRM will tell you, tune it, tune it. Um, I totally agree with that. But if you don't, you'll see that vendors' general philosophy for default settings are going to be maximum power to minimum power, and they give you the whole range. They give the RRM algorithm the whole range. Okay, and of course, your AP has some more power, and that forces the next one to it down, and forces the you know that next one back up, and the next one back down. Pretty soon, you got huge cells and small cells, and inconsistent uh, user experience. User experience is king. Some systems will keep turning power down, and that may be a good thing in that particular environment, but they get down to one milliwatt across the board, and a couple things might show up. One is you still have a lot of co-channel interference. And secondly, radios might be unstable at super low power like this. Been there, seen that. Okay? All right, so some default configuration um, beefs I have. One is this dynamic uh, channel width, 80 megahertz by default, um, mixing um, primary high and primary lows. This is, uh, has been my experience that this is a train wreck. Uh, I would say this is the number one reason I get called to troubleshoot performance. It's just awful. And, um, you know, there was one particular, to give you a, an example, there was a university, about 25,000 students, about uh, 2,500 APs. It was a 102 build, is humongous. They called me in, our stuff's just broken. And it was all 80 megahertz dynamic channel widths. It was a big mess. And, and so um, I, I went in, into one area and they, they had 28 APs where they needed 20. I mean, I'm sorry, they needed eight. And so I turned, just to show them, I turned off 20, re-channel planned it to 20, to 20 megahertz. So now I'm down to eight, eight access points at 20 megahertz channels, and it was smoking fast. So if you've, uh, if you've seen Chuck's presentation or any of his 200 presentations on VHD, um, and you should absolutely go see those, he's got one slide that he gives, gives us that, that shows an 80 megahertz channel swath that, that has one access point um, that has 100 clients on it. And then he, then he splits in his data. He has two access points, 40 megahertz wide channels, 50 on each one. And then he does the same thing for 20 megahertz, four APs, 25 on each one, and gives us the data for both uh, downlink uh, and uplink together, which bidirectional and uplink. And it shows you how dividing out your collision domains gives you so much more capacity. This is such a great thing. 
And, and if you've read uh, Mike Albano's uh, blog about uh, OBSS, a really good blog there, in my opinion, brings out in the standard how the, the backoff mechanisms and the, content, the contention mechanisms of doing clear channel assessment and, and energy detect across primaries and secondaries differs. And so you can get some pretty unexpected behaviors and suboptimal behaviors by mixing and matching your primaries and secondaries. So I'm not a fan of that at all. So I'd much rather be consistent. So uh, my counsel here is if you're going to use RRM, don't do this. You know, stick with 20s where you need them, which is most places. 40s if you can get away with it, of course. And make sure you're only using the channels you should be using. Take out any channels that shouldn't be supported, maybe a 144 or what have you. Okay? And, and can stay consistent with your primary high side or primary low side. Your question? Mm -hmm. Yep, and and I do hear this, and so, um, yeah, the question is, we uh, we've got customers that say that we we're doing bandwidth intensive applications. We need 40s, right? 40s. So my counsel there is going to be use 20s everywhere except where you need 40s. If you've got uh, uh, Mr. Engineer, Mr. Uh, uh, doctor, whoever that says, man, I'm moving these huge files, got to have the got to have the bandwidth. Give them the 40. Give everybody else the 20. Don't wreck the entire environment by saying, oh well, we're going down from 24 channels to 12 or what have you, um, in in order to give the one person the bandwidth. Give exactly the ones that need it, the wider channels, and then do a channel plan around that at 20 megahertz. That, that's the way I do it, and it seems to work out pretty, pretty well. It conserves um, collision domains. You need as many of those as you can. Okay? All right, so uh, I believe that, that vendors will use 80 megahertz wide channels by default for marketing purposes. You know, it's, um, you see in a lot of the documentation the stuff about dynamic, dynamic channel widths, and it it's great on paper right up until you have a whole bunch of um, 11AC clients, and that's where it becomes a big collision problem. But you know, it's super sexy to have 80 megahertz wide channels because you get these huge data rates, right? If you got 11AC clients, you're gonna get you know 1.3 gigs if you're in the same room. People go, man, I got 1.3 gigs, this is awesome, and I got five megs of throughput, right? But they don't notice that part. So much better to have more collision domains. So I would say that in, because of things like 80 megahertz wide channels and um, you know, dy dynamic channel widths and things like in mixing and matching uh, primaries and secondaries uh, and things like this, uh, that it oftentimes that you're gonna see a worst possible scenario uh, with RM out of the box when it's not tuned. No. Not, not to my knowledge. No, it's going to be based on RSSI and SNR and whatever, whatever that driver, that client driver is using in its RSSI mechanism. You know, you look at, let's say, apples, for example, they're, you're triggering a, a, uh, to look for the APs to roam to at neg 70, and then if they find something that's 8 dB better, then they'll attempt to roam to that. So there's the, is, most clients, uh, I think, are not going to take into consideration channel width. At least I haven't seen them. That's not to say they don't exist. But, but I'm saying that's not something I've seen very often. There was another question here somewhere. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so for, for regions where you know, DFS certification is required uh, for uni, uh, uni 2, Uni 2E, it's important to consider how DFS and, um, and these, these uh, uh, RM algorithms work together. Okay. So if you're not familiar with DFS, if um, uh, if you're going to operate on Uni 2 and 2E, you need to you have your infrastructure equipment certified. 
and it's looking for things like uh, weather radar, maritime radar, uh, military radar, things like this. If it hears a, such a signature, it is then going to immediately, move, when immediately is relative, but immediately move off the channel, um, typically to a, uh, a non-DFS channel so that it doesn't have to wait 60 seconds moving on to the, the channel it's moving to. So it's typically going to fall to a non-DFS channel like a 36 or 149. It's going to stay off that DFS channel for 30 minutes at least. And then if it wants to go back, it's got to scan for 60 seconds, which will drop all of its clients, and then it can go back onto that channel. Okay, all kinds of issues uh, that can pop up here, but this isn't a DFS uh, presentation, so we won't you know, deep dive that at the moment. Okay, so uh, if CSAs, channel switch announcements, aren't supported when it goes uh, to move off the channel, that's going to drop clients then, that's going to be a problem. If it does return to the original channel, it's going to drop the clients anyway, so that's a problem. And of course, it's my preference that the, the APs then do, do in fact move back uh, to the original uh, channel. I don't want them collecting on 36 and 149 or whatever those channels may be uh, because it turns everybody's system into Maru. Um, and so not that I'm not going to pick on Maru or anything, but I'm just saying that DFS can, can uh, be like Mr. Smith in the Matrix. It can just turn you all into Maru real fast. Okay. And so it is, in, I've seen it happen, uh, which is why I brought it up. I've actually seen that happen. Okay, so if RM makes a bad decision on the, uh, if, as for, uh, for falling back, that can bite you in the rear. Okay, so false positives uh, can be an issue, or, or they call it DFS falsing sometimes. This can be an, an issue. So uh, I just found out uh, th this past week uh, from George Stefanik that the Cisco AP can be in, in, in autonomous or controller. I'm going to go home and try it myself. Um, I'm going to set one of my APs to, a, uh, to be autonomous. But there's commands to uh, inject or to transmit a, uh, an event, if you will, a simulated event. Now, if this works, and I'm going to test the snot out of it, um, if it works, this is going to be a nice diagnostics tool, and the other vendors should probably try this too. If you, if you don't do it already, at least this is the first I've heard of it. I've been looking for something to generate those events that I could afford for a long time, so this is pretty, pretty neat. I'll be testing things like Spectrum XT to see if its, uh, it's analyzer works with these events too. So that's pretty cool. All right, so, um, oh, question? That's what I was told. I haven't seen it yet. I was told that uh, with a simple CLI command, it will generate an event. So we shall see. You put the AP on that channel, and that's how it knows which channel to go, and it, it just sends it, supposedly. I can't, can't confirm that yet. But if it works, that'll be pretty sweet. Um, okay. <laughs> Everybody's looking around going, dude, can it do it? Dude. So for DFS events, um, I, I personally think you should be monitoring this. This is something that can, you know, it can destabilize your network. I'm a big fan of stable networks, which is why I'm not necessarily a fan of RRM in many cases, okay? I want my network to be known. Um, uh, Andrew Vonnegi, as many of you guys know, he ran Target for a long time. And one of the things he told me, and this just, this just really sealed the deal for me, he says something like 35, Andrew, are you in here? Oh, cool. There you are. Um, 35,000 APs, is that right, roughly? And, and static. Now, um, if your argument is, I don't have time for that, that's too much of a pain in the neck, um, I, I guess if it was that really that bad, uh, Andrew would still be there trying to, trying to fix you know, static problems instead of being here. But it was, you had no choice. <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> You guys get the ramifications of that, don't you? Okay, so, so uh, false positives and um, and bad behavior of the infrastructure can can uh, if RRM is not um, reacting well, this can just throw another monkey wrench in there. I guess you'd say, okay, another variable. All right, so. Um, so the next one is trying to tune RRM for optimal results. So one of the, you know, and vendors will tell you this, this is, uh, this is not out of Devin's playbook, this is out of the vendor's playbook, and I agree with it. If you're going to tune power on radio resource management, then plus or minus about 3 dB is a good, um, a good way to choke the life out of it. Uh, don't give it this huge range from minimal to maximal power. Set it to the power that you think is about right for your environment based on a good design, and then give it a little bit of range up and a little bit of range down from there. Plus or minus three is what uh, vendors generally throw out there, and I think that's a reasonable number, okay? 
Uh, another uh, suggestion is, for now, uh, based on uh, the fact that it only came in with the uh, 802 ac Channel 144 should probably be not part of the mix. If you're deploying Apple TVs, um, it's been strongly suggested multiple times by respected uh, uh, friends that you take 149 and 153 out of the mix due to Wi-Fi direct connections in uh, any time you're deploying these in, let's say, education or what have you. Okay. Uh, use 20 megahertz uh, channels anytime you can. This this actually goes to both you know both static and RRM, but certainly it makes RRM's job easier. Um, I'm a big fan of disabling. I'll tell you. Let's start from the beginning. I'm a big fan of turning 2.4 gig off, off all of it off. And and then the, the people who complain and whine that it doesn't work, I just tell them to upgrade their devices. Now that's what I really want to do, but they can't do that all the time. So that being the case, I designed the 2.4 gig as best I can for the environment, remove the interfere as best I can and so on, just like you do, okay? But I have found that uh, turning off about half, anywhere up to even two thirds of the 2.4 gig radios, which may then require that you turn the 2.4 gig radios up a little bit on power uh, in order to pull that off, will result in a better network, a better behaved network. And user experience is what we're after. We want. It's pretty generic, but it like sensor mode or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree with this. Yep. So, yeah, so he was saying that um, essentially uh, just saying turn them off might be a waste of radios, that you might be able to use them for other things. Uh, RTLS monitors is a great example of that. In fact, when we design for RTLS, a lot of times we design a standard enterprise environment and then go back and overlay with sensors. They may be the same vendors, APs, acting as sensors, but they're listening only. Uh-uh. Uh, say eighty. Oh, so it's going to kill four of our channels when it does this? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Well, that comes directly from Apple, so that's gospel for me. Oh yeah, repeat it. Um, uh, the last gener the latest generation of of Apple TV that is about as thick as a bookshelf. I got one at home. I was like, wow, this is a bit much bigger. Um, and and so uh, it's 11 AC. So he's saying that it's not Wi-Fi direct. That it's using necessarily something similar. And it instead of the 40 megahertz, it takes 80. Uh, thanks. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so shameless self plug. Okay. 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 Yep. That you said you said that was no strings attached. Okay. Yeah. So he was uh, Sam was saying that he and Blake just released a no strings attached uh, podcast based on turning ra uh, unused radios into sensors and and such as that for for monitoring. So the thing, Chuck. And I always do, yeah. But my argument here is, is not about whether you want to do a good design or a bad design. The issue that I'm looking at is whether you want to let an algorithm do it or you want to do it manually. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, in, a, in a nutshell, if you want to interpret Chuck into English, um, <laughs> he threw out about 16 things in four words. I don't know how he does that. And, and uh, it was things like trimming your rates and, and other really technical things. But do a good design and, and uh, 
And, and, if, and if you want the rest, there's about 8,000 slides. Um, so, so I don't disagree, but my, my argument here, and we could bunny trail all day, there's a lot of great things we're talking about at the conference, but I'm trying to get to, to the one factoid of um, should, you know, can RRM do a better job than static, and if so, when, and if not, why do we use it, and when, we, when would we use it, et cetera. It's just the, the, the dividing line between those two things is all, okay? So um, here's some uh, recommendations um, that has been, it worked really well for me. Uh, I know some other folks in the audience who, in fact, uh, have worked through some of these numbers and it's worked really well. We've done a lot of designs based on this. So, um, you know, these, by the way, these numbers um, uh, have worked out pretty well as E, uh, I'm sorry, as uh, intentional radiator uh, when you're talking about output power. It says start with 7 to 10, intentional radiator, not EIRP. So it's a little higher with EIRP. And then if you're doing things like uh, one AP per classroom, which, you know, we don't do that, do we? Um, <laughs> but let's say we were, because I've had to do it a few times myself. You know, we want a funny story. Keith and I released the white paper on, on this. Um, you know, he did the first, first copy, and then we, uh, I went through and, and helped him rewrite this thing. And we released this, and of course it was very controversial. Don't do one AP per classroom. He sends me out to a school as a subcontractor for him uh, to a place in like Chicago, was it Chicago? Uh, and go out there and measure some walls for him for one of his designs. He didn't have time to go out. So I did it for him. I come back, and these walls were like 30, 40, 50 dB. They were humongous. And he said, we're going to have to do one AP per classroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> oh, it's not kind of common. It's like everywhere I go. So for, yeah, for storm, that's right, for storm shelters, uh, it's pretty common. It's pretty common anyway, um, and I, I see it a lot because of the sales process and how it works with vendors. Vendors trying to make numbers, hit it by the end of the quarter, that's a whole another ball of wax. I, I could be up here for days. Um, so some of the problems that, that I see um, is I'll, I'll see, you know, multiple uh, access points on the same channel in a row, big cell, little cell, uh, different things like this. So I, I will say, um, you know, test it. You know, if you're gonna use RRM, don't just turn it on and say, man, these vendors are awesome. They, they just know everything. They, they know a lot, I give them that. But you should test it. Go do a survey today, then go do a survey tomorrow, and then go do a survey after that. And let's see what changed. Why did it change? How much did it change? Does it work still? Test your performance, um, you know, and see, is that changing, okay? So it doesn't have, RRM doesn't have a client-side perspective. It doesn't communicate with a client-side agent. No, not even CCX, because it died in like 06. Um, and so, to be honest, um, I know I did that homework. Uh, oh, I was 05? Um, so <laughs> so it, there's not a lot of com um, uh, communication, or if any, between clients and infrastructure on this. There should be. This would be great, by the way. Uh, I think this would be a way to enhance RRM if we're going to use it. Let Give it client-side perspective. That's a good thing. All right? If the even if your infrastructure is perfectly configured, then you may still have you know, uh, the clients causing co-channel interference out there. That's a, a big deal, okay? We call it client-induced interference a lot of times. That's a Cisco term I borrowed from Matt Schwartz I thought was a really good term, okay? So clients move and APs don't. So uh, that's another, another issue to take into consideration here. Now, let's talk about OPEX and CAPEX. I think that is a, uh, a really big dividing line. You know, anything is possible with time and money. I heard that said a long time ago, and I totally agree with that. So I've found with small deployments, when you're talking 5 or 10 or 20 APs, it's a wash, man. It's not that big of a deal to do it either way. And hopefully in a small environment, RRM is a lot better than it's going to be in a large environment. That should, you know, the complexities of large environments in three dimensions can get ugly. And granted, you know, these algorithms would have to have huge amounts of inf information in them uh, and input into them to work properly in those complex environments. But in small environments, it's not that big a, th big a thing. However, having said that, in my house, uh, only recently, 104, 104, and 36. I mean, what happened? <clears throat> Yeah, 
it is entirely possible, but, but we don't know. And on top of that, if it, if it didn't see any other channels whatsoever, and there are none in my environment, just nothing, um, you'd think that the human intuition of it would be, you know, put one in each, each of the, the bands, but that ain't what happened. It doesn't have intuition. It doesn't, you know, what, in a, like Chuck said, any two engineers, any three engineers are gonna be different opinions. Maybe they are, uh, the algorithm was thinking it was a little smarter than us, but, okay. So uh, with, your, with your larger deployments, your, your, you know, your, your CapEx, this is the capital expenditure, this is the upfront investment in, in time is, is going to be um, uh, lower and your OPEX over time is going to be higher. So uh, I think that, that it's important to understand, yes, you have to make an in investment uh, in this upfront, but over time, you know, uh, if you had a lifetime of, let's say, five years on your Wi-Fi, wi vendors wish it w your lifetime was only one year, of course, because they could sell you stuff more often, but let's call it five years. And and, and if you had a lifetime of five years, then uh, you want to make sure that, that the network is stable, your, your help desk calls are low, and people's stuff just work. And if you're gonna troubleshoot, that you're just troubleshooting client-side stuff, which is most of the problem anyway. If you go to troubleshoot clients, like you know uh, Coleman was showing us, you go to troubleshoot clients, if your infrastructure suddenly moves underneath you and starts changing the environment, this is something I don't think is going to be helping you any. It may think it's helping you, but it's actually hindering your troubleshooting, okay? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, one of the, one of the points um, that I have, I, it's one of these slides, is is uh, uh, some vendors. Uh, I, I I teach vendors as well, and uh, some of the vendors say, well, our you know way we do it because we don't trust our own RM algorithm uh, as field engineers, which is not a bad approach. Uh, they said, turn it on. Let it, let it do its thing for, for two, three, four days, even a week. Let it stabilize, watch it, and five minutes, okay. And, and then, um, and then tur turn it off, and then optimize. Then go back and troubleshoot and see if it's made bad decisions. That's not a bad approach. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's not a bad approach either, okay? Yep, I agree. Yep, I can see it. That's a business decision and it's a valid one. In fact, using RM or not is a, is a valid business. It, business plays into it, absolutely does. Um, you know, reacting to events can, can set off chain reactions. And of course, some vendors have dampening mechanisms to say don't, you know, don't react again after you just reacted and things like this. They certainly do. Uh, but in, in general, this is a reactive scenario. So uh, the more variables you have in the system, the, the more uh, reactive it gets, the more troubleshooting, you know, time and resources you're going, going to uh, consume, and of course, more client de uh, device downtime. There's no necessarily uh, vendor agreed upon best practices uh, for this. Everybody's RM is different. They work differently. So uh, that being the case, trying to get vendors to agree on anything, uh, if one of them goes left, the other one goes right, uh, just because the other one went left. I mean, they're all trying to be different from each other, so they can say, you know, our stance is better than yours. We need more standards. We need more de facto standards. We need some, uh, as a group, this group um, is one that can implement stuff like this, can come together and say, this is the best way to do this. Don't care what any vendor marketing says. And we can help the vendors get on board with that. I totally agree, uh, think that's possible, okay? And best practices should be con considered for, um, for default configurations. I understand maximum flexibility and connectivity and things like this, but you know, some pre-tuning would really do us uh, all a service, I believe, okay? So I think that if there's no best practices, you know, there's a high chance that uh, we're going to see a lot of detune networks uh, right out of the right out of the gate. Okay, so some questions to ask before you use it. You know, can a static channel and power plan uh, provide optimal performance? Can it? And does it? Okay, how do you know? Test it. Valid. You know, Keith likes to say design, design, design. I like to say validate, validate, validate. I think both of us have that right. Okay. 
Is the CapEx OpEx trade-off worth it to me? Uh, do I have the time to invest in this or do I not? Some people say, dude, I, I'm handling firewalls and switches and routers and Wi-Fi and everything else in the world. I got no time for a manual channel plan configuration. I can't do it. I turn on RM and I got to deal with whatever it gives me. I hope it's good. Okay. So there's nothing to do about that in that environment. That's that, and, and that's one of the reasons that RM can be good. It, it solves that problem, okay? Do I want it reacting to events? That depends. Get rid of as many interferences as you can, and then uh, if you're doing manual uh, plan, uh, you're doing a manual plan, then adjust your environment manually, and, if, and, if, and then if you use an RM, see if it does the job right. Test it, look at it, monitor it. Don't just throw it out there, turn it on and call it a day. Don't assume anything. How do you know if it's good enough? How much time are you spending uh, on it? So you get the assertion that RM works just fine for me. How do you know? You know, how, how did you test it, okay? How often do you test it? When you upgraded the code, rebooted the controller, did, did you test it? Nobody does, nobody does. Do I obsess over it? Oh. Yeah, I guess suppose if you're obsessive compulsive, you might, but, but I would say um, it would be reasonable to think, you know, my, my controller has been up for a while or my, you know, controller list has been up for a while and it's, it's running. Let me take a look at it and let, let me look at it every so often thereafter. It don't have to be, you know, every day, but if, if it's working, it's working. What can you say? I mean, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. User experience is king. That's the end all be all. If it works for you, it works for you. I mean, I, I won't argue that point. If, go ahead. Um, first, I'd want the ability to turn it off. <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't think you can simplify it that far. My, my assertion is RRM is not smart enough. So uh, if, if, I wanted, if I wanted to build an RRM, RRM algorithm, we'd be there, we'd be there for years. Um, and that's the problem. If I can get to my last slide, I'll make that assertion uh, in a way that I think you'll understand. Um, uh, so you know, a lot of folks will say, what do you do when you can't get rid of the interferers? You know, you have inter immovable interferers. You know, for me, getting rid of the interferers is the goal, okay? So ultimately, you know, if you, whether the assertion is the best RM is no better than a static config, I make that assertion myself sometimes, I do. Um, but really, it comes down to testing. The, the proof's in the pudding. Survey, and then survey, and then survey again, and look, and see. Now, I'm not saying survey every day of your life, that's silly. Uh, but I am saying test, test it. If you do pilot tests and, uh, uh, before you deploy into production, um, then you should very well do validation testing after, okay? So um, I, I think you know, it's a reasonable uh, thing to do to test at least a little bit. Okay. It, does it take too long? I think it may take some time in larger environments. It's possible. Uh, they could take a while, but the, it may lower OPEX for you. Huh. Right, of course. I, I'm not a fan of surveying, you know, every other day. I think that's a waste of money. Uh, but I think a, a validation is valid. And if it's working, it, you know, if it's static, you know what you have. You surveyed. You know what you have. Um, but then uh, RRM may make changes, and then you don't know what you have. And that is one of my biggest beefs with it, is you may not know exactly what you have. It changes, and it's reactive. Okay. So it's an, an administrative judgment call based on time, available time, money, uh, and whether you tested it and does it work or not. And uh, I'll take one more question before I hit my last slide. Scott? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
That's probably, that's probably the most valid point I've ever heard made on, in, in favor of RM. Is that you know, basically what he's saying is the market's like a pyramid. Your, your, your middle and upper tier architects, they understand how to do a, a really good design, right? And if you do a good design and implement it, that's great. But if you don't know much about Wi Fi, you don't know how to do a good design, then it very well could be that RM is smarter than you. <laughs> and so it may make better decisions than you. I still think you need to tune it. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't argue against that. Um, it's that's a it's a fair assertion. In some some cases, I'm an idealist about things. I want to I want people to get educated. I want them to know how to do this. That's not to say that everybody will or or does. So I'll make my my last stand here, if you will, and then uh, if Keith will allows me any other questions, he may not. Um, and that is, I think that sometimes RM can be uh, error prone. It, it based on have they messed with the algorithm? Have they upgraded it? Um, you know, does it work in your environment? And every environment's different. Um, maybe you want 40 megahertz channels versus 20s and that makes it a little harder. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, I look at this in kind of a visual way. I said, you know, here we've got our Mercedes F015 self-driving RRM car. Uh, and if it's, you know, it's always having issues because you reboot the controller or you uh, upgrade the algorithm or you rebuild the kernel or whatever the heck it is you're going to do, um, you, you're introducing more variables. More variables is uh, going to change your environment more. It's going to increase, uh, uh, increase instability and I'm against that. So I look at this in a, uh, in, as a comparison to maybe a, a for you Europeans that are lucky enough to have Toyota Hiluxes. We don't get those here in the U.S. Dang it. Um, we have to settle for the Tacoma. Um, so, you know, it's an, doing a static plan is like an indestructible truck. It just goes. You crank it up, it goes. You, you drive it off a cliff and it crashes and burns and you still crank it up and go. And you drive it into the ocean, leave it for a year and you get it, you drag it back out and it cranks up and goes. It just won't die. Um, but RRM can work itself into some weird situations and, and you're relying on an algorithm that you might not understand. So if you're going to use it, test it, validate it, make sure you know what it's doing and if it's doing it right or not. So that, that's it for me.